Hi, hello everyone, and welcome to the uh, fifth lecture in the Decolonizing, Curating in the Museum in Southeast Asia series, uh, which is jointly organized by the Southeast Asia Art uh, Academic Program, SOAS University of London, and the Asian Civilizations Museum, Singapore. Um, let me just, uh, so actually this is the second to last uh, lecture in the series, uh, and uh, you can sign up for the, last, the final one, which is uh, next uh, Thursday at the same time uh, by scanning that uh, QR code. So my name is uh, Conan Cheong. I'm a curator for Southeast Asia at the ACM, and I will be your host for uh, this online event. I'd, I'd just like to thank the Alpha Web Foundation and the Chris Foundation for their support of this series, uh, and also my uh, co-organizer, Dr. Stephen Murphy at, um, at SOAS, for making this um, uh, collaboration between our two institutions possible. Uh, so we are recording today's session uh, and it will be available on the uh, SOAS Center for Southeast Asia Studies uh, page afterwards uh, if you want to uh, watch it again. Um, okay, so today we are very pleased to have Dr. Ricardo Punzalan uh, with his lecture, Decolonization in Colonial Institutions, uh, Reparative Approaches to Philippine Collections in a U.S. University. Um, after uh, Dr. Punzalan gives his uh, talk, uh, we will have a response uh, by Dr. Christina Martinez uh, Juan, who I'll introduce later. And uh, finally, we'll, we'll take some questions from the audience, uh, which you can you know, type into the Q&A box. Uh, please click the Q&A box and not the chat box. Um, you can type, it, type your questions in at any time in the presentation, and we will take it uh, at the end of the session. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce Dr. Punzalan. Uh, Dr. Ricardo Punzalan is uh, an associate professor at the University of Michigan, where he teaches archives and digital curation. He studies access and use of digitized anthropological archives and ethnographic data by academic and indigenous researchers. He is currently a research associate at the Smithsonian's National Anthropological Archives and a former, former council member of the Society of American Archivists. So uh, just please note that uh, Dr. Gonzalez will not be using uh, PowerPoint uh, slides in his presentation. So uh, you know, don't be alarmed if you don't see anything on your screen. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, with that, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this lecture series, particularly uh, Dr. Stephen Murphy for the invitation to speak at this event and uh, for uh, Conan Chung for co-hosting. I'm also grateful to Dr. Christina Martinez Juan for agreeing to serve as my discussant uh, for today. Uh, so I grew up in the Philippines, but I currently work and reside in the state of Michigan. So before I proceed, I'd like to give a land acknowledgement. Um, so the University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Bodewadami nations made the single largest uh, land transfer to the University of Michigan. This was offered ceremonially as a gift through the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids so that their children could be educated. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. My goal today is to discuss how I come to understand decolonization and how it might operate as a framework for managing, re representing, and engaging with the sizable Philippine collections at the University of Michigan. So what constitutes reparative work in the decolonization of the university's Philippine collections? In answering this question, I wish to present what I learned so far from an ongoing effort called Reconnect, Recollect, Reparative Connections to Philippine Collections at the University of Michigan, which is a two-year project that I'm co-leading with Dr. Deirdre de la Cruz, Associate Professor of History and Asian Languages and Cultures, and in partnership with librarians, archivists, curators, and collections managers in, two, in three university institutions. Um, and these are the University of Michigan's Bentley Historical Library with about 259 collections uh, in their catalog pertaining to the Philippines. Um, the Special Collections Research Center, which holds approximately 50 collections of archival and manuscript material 
uh, relating to Spanish American War, the Philippine War, um, the University of Michigan's uh, involvement with the uh, in the Philippines by scientific investigations, and um, also um, about 1,500 published works on Philippine history and culture. And the third is the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology with 25,000 archaeological artifacts, 72 human crania, and several hundred postcranial elements, 1,800 ethnographic objects, 42 zoological specimens, and 617 ethnobotanical specimens. Uh, the collection at this museum also includes about 5,000 glass plate negatives and lantern slides. Uh, I'd like to note uh, that the university's Philippine collections extend beyond these three partner institutions. Philippine materials are also kept in the following university institutions. Uh, the Stearns Collection of Musical Instruments, which has um, at least 13 items with Philippine provenance in the collection. The Clark Library, which is a repository of maps and atlases from the 16th century to the present. Uh, the Clements Library, which is a repository of rare books and manuscripts. And the Museum of Zoology, which has about 2,000 birds. Mollocks of approximately 200, 250 lots, representing nearly 1,000 specimens and 150 species, and 3,108 specimens of mammals from the Philippines. There's also the university's herbarium, which has about 6,000 items from the Philippines, which include ferns, algae, flowering plants, fungi, mosses, conifers, and lichens. And finally, the university's botanical gardens, which of course would have Philippine plant species. Um, I'm belaboring, uh, sh you know, describing the extent of the collection to emphasize a point that there's uh, a sizable Philippine collection in, in this university. So in May and June of this year, our group facilitated a series of conversations. The first define what it means to pursue decolonial praxis for Philippine collections. Second, identify institutional obligations and articulating reparative work. The third is to reimagine community engagement. And finally, to explore how we can decenter the existing colonial provenance, attribution, and description to better uh, represent indigenous communities and knowledge to understand the full extent of the collection. Our series of roundtable and listening sessions engage Philippine studies scholars, archivists, cultural heritage workers, activists, and members of the Filipino community here in Michigan to better understand what constitutes reparative and decolonial approaches to the collections of Philippine materials. We also invited uh, speakers from the Philippines. So decolonization has become widely used in cultural heritage and academic circles. Many have become critical of the many misappropriations of the term. Critical race, uh, indigenous studies and education scholars like Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang's essay, Decolonization is not a metaphor, for instance, had made me reflect on how decolonization might operate in the settler colonialist context of the United States. For Tuck and Yang, decolonization was about indigenous sovereignty and self-determination or the return of stolen land to native tribes as, uh, as the scope and scale of decolonial struggle. As such, it's used in libraries, archives, and museums, such as decolonize the reading room, decolonize the stacks, decolonizing the catalog, or even our focus today, decolonizing, curating, and the museum to mean incorporating indigenous knowledge and perspectives in revising our catalogs and databases or exhibit labels in creating a welcoming space, in diversifying the staff, or in auditing collections for culturally sensitive or stolen items may not be appropriate use of the term, unless these practices ultimately result in the return of stolen indigenous lands. To some, it sounds like decolonization is yet another word for knowledge appropriation and extractive relations that only benefit institutions in terms of better audience experience, collections management, diversifying staff and visitors, 
increasing grant funding support, and so on. Thus, the overuse of the term decolonization has impacted its meaning, its attachment to pre-existing frameworks of social justice, though well-meaning, can remove its connection to the realities of indigenous life and settler colonialism. But I am not recommending giving up on the use of the term just yet. What I advocate for is a radical reflection and reorientation of the management, representation of you and use of Philippine indigenous materials, which document diverse knowledge and traditions. Because decolonization can mean many things to many people and without specificity as to its use as a concept or politics or practice, it threatens to mean little at all. Thus, the challenge for us is to understand decolonization as a meaningful concept in the Philippine historical context and for Filipinos. The issue of decolonizing uh, the Philippine collections at the University of Michigan offers forms of context and considerations. Despite the large accumulation of indigenous material at the university, we lack culturally appropriate frameworks and policies for uh, navigating access, building community relations, and instituting reparative actions. Though the Philippines shares a common and connected history of colonialism with US indigenous tribes, our experiences of and receptions to colonialism are not the same. Different cultures respond to colonialism differently. Thus, protocols and guidelines developed for Native American collections are not always appropriate and sustainable in the context of Philippine collections. So far, I have not heard of any requests to repatriate any, any item held by the university. It might be different case if Philippine indigenous tribes rely on those archival sources and museum artifacts for use in a land claim or to meet some government recognition requirements like the federal recognition process in the United States. Philippine materials are also not legally covered by NAGPRA, which stands for the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which is the law that protects US Native American graves and requires repatriation of Native human, American human remains and certain cultural and sacred items. This context challenges us to rethink what the university's institutional obligations to Philippine cultural objects might be. And this in turn affects what we might consider as constitu constituting the decolonization of Philippine collections at this university. Let's go back to my question earlier. What constitutes reparative work in the decolonization of the university's Philippine collections? The focus on reparative work is intentional here because I believe that the sizable volume of Philippine historical, natural, and cultural collections at the university amassed from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th underscore this institution's role in US colonial expansion. Michigan faculty, students, and alumni went to the Philippines to teach, conduct field research, establish business ventures, and participate in colonial administration. At the height of the US colonial era in the Philippines, Michigan men, as they were called, took pride in their dual identities as Michigan alumni and colonial officials. As George A. Malcolm, the founding dean of the law school of the University of the Philippines, in his speech in Manila in 1914, while convening the University of Michigan Alumni Association of the Philippine Islands stated, and I quote, in the Philippine Islands, we claim, and we are able to substantiate the same by facts, that the University of Michigan Alumni Association is the largest in number in the Far East. Not only this, but it can be safely asserted that its members occupy as important positions in the affairs of the Philippines as do the alumni of any other university. This has been so from the beginning of the American occupation so that now there are only Michigan men prominent in official and private circles, but Michigan men in the army, the Navy, and among the Filipino, Japanese, and Chinese communities. The university need not be ashamed of their work. It need not fear that its tradition and future are forgotten. 
all Michigan men in the East of whatever locality or nationality join in the assurance that their alma mater can count upon their cordial support. The presence of the so-called Michigan men in the islands resulted in the accumulation of one of the largest Philippine collections in North America. But the harms you associate with these collections are not only limited in the context of their accumulation. In this presentation, I'd like to present two persistent areas of harm associated with these collections. Um, the first is the decades of lack of real and sustainable connections with Philippine communities here in the US and in the Philippines over the management and representation of these materials. After more than a century, it is time for the university to address its colonial complicity in the formation of these collections by developing decolonial practices so that institutions can provide reciprocal and reparative access to Philippine cultural collections. Reconceptualizing archival and museum work from the perspective of relationships, building where bonds do not exist, or repairing when trust has been broken has become a significant theme in archives and museum scholarship. We can build on the more recent efforts in decolonial archives and museology, which foreground indigenous perspectives and community collaboration, consultation, and dialogue to construct a model of relationality and shared stewardship. Although we have seen significant progress in centering indigenous knowledge frameworks for North American tribal collections, such as the adoption of the protocols for Native American archival materials, uh, comparable approaches are still missing for non-North American collections taken from uh, former US colonial territories that are not covered by legal regimes like NAGPRA, the law which I just mentioned uh, earlier. We can also take uh, the methodological approach of reparative work that foregrounds community relationships to inspire culturally appropriate curation and scholarly endeavors that address the harmful legacies of colonial collections. We can implement decolonial practice through community consultations rather than apply protocols that are universally defined and enacted for every institution, culture, and community. Many current and previous projects have attempted to address the responsibility and care for colonial collections at the level of digital access through the creation of online databases, web access portals, or virtual exhibitions. But digital humanities efforts that rely heavily on the creation of digital infrastructures without appropriate investment in building community relations or input from community members can end up reproducing some of the problems they seek to redress, generating new tools for the same epistemologies. If the goal is to facilitate broader community impact, efforts must therefore begin and end with better relationships between institutions and communities. My understanding of reciprocity is informed by the work of indigenous education scholars, Heather McGregor and Michael Marker, who provide the following characteristics of the concept. First, reciprocity as giving back or involving power flowing back and forth within parties, ensuring that relationships are not extractive. Second, reciprocity as sharing knowledge or a cyclical and circulating responsibility to teach what one has learned, passing on knowledge between generations. Third, Reciprocity as relational accountability, where relationships are characterized by respect and the interests of communities uh, inform all aspects of work. And fourth, reciprocity as circular and continuous, not a system of gifts and counter gifts, but a constant coexistence and kinship. I take this set of characteristics to be the defining goals of for curatorial and museum reciprocity, relationships, practices, and projects that give back and recognize power dynamics, share knowledge, are held accountable, and are continuous or sustainable. Curatorial and museum reciprocity must therefore consider the meaningful outcomes and changes that result from reparative interventions. Here I offer uh, six indicators of impact to help us identify our institutional obligations in reparative work, namely knowledge, 
attitudes, professional discourse, institutional capacity, policy, and relationships. So for knowledge, a uh, critical question could be, what new knowledge about the collections, their history, representational tools and uses have we discovered? Are we using the collections in meaningful ways and in diverse settings, going beyond the exhibition hall, reading rooms and classrooms, but into community-based learning spaces? In terms of attitudes, is there a shift in the attitudes and practices of those who steward the collections around collections management, representation, access, and use? Or do community members feel welcome to visit, access, consult, or use items in the collections, or interact with librarians, archivists, curators, or collections managers? In terms of professional discourse, is there a renewed understanding of responsibilities over collection stewardship and sense of ownership among curators, librarians, and archivists responsible for collections care and management. Here I put ownership in quotes. And for institutional capacity, a good question could be, how have we developed a set of guidelines for reparative practice that enables institutions to better represent their collections and better connect with the communities represented in their collections or perhaps created new and efficient ways of managing collections. So for policy impact, does the project lead to or inspire efforts to revise or create new institutional, uh, whether written or unwritten policies around collections care and representation? And, follow, and finally, for uh, you know, impact on relationships, have we facilitated the formation of a reciprocal relationship among institutions, scholars, and community members? And I'd like to go next to the second um, harm that I see um, from these collections, which is uh, the harmful description and metadata and the prevailing and the and the privileging of colonial provenance and glorification of colonial actors in our finding aids and catalogs. We can decenter colonial uh, creators and collectors in finding aids and provide equal attribution to the communities represented by the collections. The racist, outdated, and culturally insensitive terminologies in finding aids and other descriptive materials can be revisited through the process called reparative description. Archival scholars have in recent years focus their attention on reparative description and corrective action, which seek to redress historical inequities and injustices in the ways language is used in archives and special collections. Especially in the social and political context of the United States, we have witnessed in more recent years the rise of racial violence as a social crisis. Archivists would like to read address the crisis of racial inequalities as reflected in the collections. Collections in Western institutions gathered by virtue of colonization, materials that contain violent images, or those that depict troubling historical events, including outdated, racist, incorrect, or inappropriate metadata and description, are not only distressful to indigenous community members, but they can also um, limit wider disco discovery access and meaningful engagement or use. The aim of reparative description is to find ways to decenter the colonial provenance of collections to better represent indigenous communities and knowledge, as well as gain better understanding of the full extent of those collections. It is no secret that uh, university collections are, un, um, are often attributed to collectors whose career as academics or civil servants were deeply linked with colonial governance. For example, until recently, the whole collection of Philippine archives, rare books, and manuscripts at the university's special collections library is attributed to Dean C. Wooster, whose entire career as a colonial administration administrator was to rationalize the U.S. occupation of the islands. Through his photographic images and writings, Wooster depicted Filipinos as savages, unfit for self-governance, and required American tut tutelage and civilization. We can offer alternative descriptions that highlight 
the numerous indigenous communities in this collection. The graduate students who uh, conducted the preliminary survey of Philippine uh, collections at the university has noted that for collections in natural history institutions, such as the Museum of Zoology, the Herbarium, and the Botanical Gardens, the scientific naming practices in of themselves are not actually indicative of harm, but the use of disciplinary nomenclature does not leave room for cultural or historical context. Thus, they leave the significance of these specimens for Filipino communities unaddressed. Consequently, scientific nomenclature elides the relationship that local communities have in these specimens. So we must develop models for culturally responsive and historically minded stewardship and care of Philippine materials in non-Philippine institutions. The Philippine cultural and natural history materials dispersed across various Michigan libraries, archives, and museums have been built without any community consultation with Filipinos in the Philippines and in the diaspora. The lack of a comprehensive invent inventory of the full extent of the Philippine historical, cultural, and scientific items at the university further complicates attempts to fully address and utilize these collections. Filipino, Filipino-American, Filipinex communities living in Michigan and in the Philippines seek to develop greater connections and engagement with the Philippine collections at the university. Furthermore, librarians, archivists, curators, and collections managers who steward these collections seek to apply reparative approaches to collections care and representation and build better community ties. Thus, to repeat my earlier statement, we, we, we can reconceptualize cultural heritage work from the perspective of relationships. Building where bonds, are not, uh, bonds that do not exist are repairing, the, uh, repairing when trust has been broken. We cannot do this without actively seeking community input. How do we activate the Philippine collections at Michigan to better serve Filipino, Filipino-American, and Filipinex communities? living in the United States, in the state of Michigan, and in the Philippines. To do this, we must address the issue of limited access to Michigan's Philippine collections. In surveying the existing access infrastructures that had been built by the university's repositories, it became clear that, only, um, that not only those infrastructures are lacking coordination and integration across multiple units, but community input was almost non-existent. The dispersion of cultural items across uh, you know, the various institutions of the university, the lack of comprehensive descriptive access tools and missing Filipino voices make discovery and use particularly challenging. At this juncture, it is useful to take our cue from scholars of indigenous archives, Kimberly Christian and Jane Anderson, who advocate for one mode of decolonizing processes that insist on a different temporal framework, which is the slow archives. According to Kristen and Anderson, slowing down creates a necessary space for emphasizing how knowledge is produced, circulated, contextualized, and exchanged through a series of relationships Slowing down, slowing down is about focusing differently, listening carefully, and acting ethically. It opens the possibility of seeing the intricate web of relationships formed and forged through attention to collaborative curation processes that do not default on normative structures of attribution, access, or scale. Focusing on the temporality of slow archives is not meant to post binary between fast and slow. Rather, slowness is imagined and enacted in terms of relationality, positionality, and a framework that privileges restorative and reparative work that is decolonial in its logic and practice. Slow archives do not presume one course of action. In fact, they allow for changing course, for shifts, and for unexpected endings. The slow archives pivots around the register of decolonization as a processual move in centering indigenous temporalities, territorialities, and rel relationalities on their own, as well as the conversation with settler colonial logics and practices. <laughs>
I'm focusing on um, slow archives because it seems to me that most of the time, more often than not, when I go to institution and dis institutions and discuss uh, what to do with Philippine uh, collections, uh, the, the tendency is to have this fast decision-making process that somewhat always leads to digitization and uh, the creation of uh, web exhibits, so forth and so on. And I do think that we should start investing our time instead in the slower process of relationship building. So to conclude, a first step to decolonizing Philippine uh, university collections is to prioritize the slow path of reparative actions to mitigate the repair or repair the harm of traditional curation, representation, and scholarship that has largely ignored community voices and perspectives, glorified colonial actors, and almost exclusively catered to academic researchers. In addition, decolonial work requires that we examine curation as a whole, accounting for the whole spectrum of cultural heritage institutions, from, from galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, or the glam sector, and not just collections and museums. In engaging Michigan's collections, I learned that Philippine items are dispersed across the multiple units of the university that have been historically siloed. Hence, we cannot decolonize museum objects without paying the same amount of attention to archives and library collections. Decolonization therefore demands that we see the discernible connections and relationships between communities, institutions, and collections. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pantala, for that very uh, thought-provoking presentation. And uh, to respond to your lecture, um, we have uh, Dr. Christina martinez Juan, uh, who is a senior teaching and research fellow and the project head uh, for Philippine Studies at SOAS, or PSS, an interdisciplinary forum for Philippine-related teaching, research, and cultural production in the UK. She is the principal investigator for Mapping Philippine Material Culture, an open access knowledge base that sources annotative knowledge uh, from cultural originators in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. So um, yeah, without further ado, Dr. Martinez Juan, please. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Ricky, for giving us the lowdown on the Philippine collection at the University of Michigan. I didn't realize how big and also how dispersed the collection was and how the school itself and its alumni were so complicit in American colonial expansion in the Philippines. Um, especially intrigued by the fact that um, aside from the infamous Dean Worcester and his obsession with the non-Christian savages, um, there were other Michigan men, uh, especially Carl E. Guth, I, I guess he's, uh, he was the first director of the University's Museum of Anthropology. I was interested in him because um, being from Cebu, I'm excited to see what he added to the university's collection, as it is sometimes rare to uh, see objects in museums from the so-called lowland and Christianized areas, um, especially in the Visayas. No? Uh, so I can't wait to look more deeply into the entire collection. Uh, and so thank you for doing the survey and introducing us to our, your Reconnect, Recollect project uh, with its mission to produce uh, reparative approaches no, to Philippine collections at the University of Michigan. Um, uh, foregrounding your uh, presentation with reference to Tuck and Young's um, article, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, was uh, very helpful. Um, the provocative ideas they put forward on moves to innocence, uh, which are basically diversions, they call, which relieve the colonizer from feelings of guilt or responsibility and conceal the need to actually give up land or power or privilege. No, is indeed a crucial decolonizing benchmark. Um, sometimes um, there's a tendency to focus only on decolonizing the mind or um, making um, epistemological violence as a stand-in you know, for the more uh, 
uncomfortable task of relinquishing actual material capital or um, indeed helping in making, uh, this kind of helps um, make decolonization as a kind of a toothless signifier for many. Or I, I guess as someone had put it, um, decolonization has be become a cliche. But um, <clears throat> I do appreciate the fact that uh, you did not stop with Tuck and Yang and recognize that there is no global answer uh, to the question, what is colonization? In fact, I think um, they some in some way contradict themselves when they say that colonialism can and must only be defined as settler colonialism. And so negating their kind of other proposition of a need to pay attention to the specific colonial apparatuses within a particular um, time and space. So I guess I'm glad that you haven't given up on the term uh, decolonizing yet, um, but instead offer real targeted strategies for upsetting the balances of power. So uh, let me begin the discussion by posing a few questions to provoke further thought. So I'm just, I've, I've just segmented some of my questions into kind of big tranches and you can feel free to uh, discuss after I, I go through one point. So at the core of your reparative strategy, uh, there seems to be the foregrounding you know, of the idea of reciprocity. So you talk about the need to address the lack of real and sustainable collections, uh, connections with Philippine communities um, in the US and the Philippines um, over the management and the representation of the collections materials. So uh, in your talk, you, you talked about uh, reciprocity that, to, that envisions a relationship where power flows back and forth um, uh, between parties, uh, a relationship that is not extractive and that uh, where both sides are mutually accountable to each other. But I guess, I guess for me, we know that since the 1990s um, and like with James Clifford's 1997 essay on um, the museum as a contact zone and maybe even Robin uh, Bo's 2011 influential critique on this, um, it seems to me that there has not been a lack of co-curatorial endeavors and inclusionist programs in exhibitions. So I guess my question is, why do you think has there been little or no previous attempts at reciprocal custodianship in relation to the Philippine materials at the University of Michigan? Um, I guess, uh, was it a lack of curatorial interest and valuation coming from within the institution? Um, I'm kind of familiar with this marginalization as I do think that more often than not, the Philippines is always falls into the category of an orphaned collection, um, both from within Southeast Asia and from the more encyclopedic world of the museum in general. You hardly ever see anything, any of the objects on display or uh, hardly ever uh, have any exhibits, no big exhibits on, on, on the Philippines. So uh, I end this segment with a question, how, how do you increase, or do you agree that there is um, there is a, a lack of curatorial interest, no, uh, from from the within the institutions? And how do you increase, or how have you increased institutional interest in this marginalized collection? And and I guess the other question is, should 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 we be addressing this marginalization uh, as and make it as one of the goals of a decolonizing agenda, kind of like the double marginalization of um, particular uh, collections. Sorry, I was I was making notes because uh, <laughs> the, this is a wonderful question, and indeed, it's like a, you know um, a fascinating um, question, you know. Why not, you know, um, you know, um, to give you a little bit more context here, you know, like the, the, the university has uh, for decades uh, hosted Philippine scholars, mm -hmm. you know, like 
giving them, uh, there's even a specific scholarship for Filipinos to come and study at the university. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's one um, program for women, uh, the Barber Scholarship, uh, you know, mm -hmm. for, and, and uh, that expanded into Asian women, but it started as Filipinos. Uh, the Pensionados, the early Filipinos uh, scholars who studied in uh, the U.S. sponsored by this government, a lot of them went to Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's Michigan faculty. Uh, there's a sizable Philippine um, population in Ann Arbor and in the state of Michigan. And of course, you know, what in the, the United States, I think Filipinos are the fourth largest immigrant population. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, um, so the first thing I would say is like, uh, you know, just th there's no process of elimination. Um, so mm -hmm. it's not the lack of people. Mm -hmm right it's there are filipinos it, it, within the structure of the universe we may, we're not that many but we're here mm -hmm. um and uh, so there are filipinos there's filipino community right so and 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 there are filipinos uh who come to study the collection as fulbright scholars and as you know given the extent of the collections uh, the filipinos who um come here study just about you know, a, a per, you know, whole range of what could be studied from um, snails uh, to combat this like snail uh, born disease in the Philippines to, um, you know, looking at ceramics of, of the Gute collection that you mentioned earlier to, you know, uh, studying the Wooster photographs on like textile and weaving mm -hmm. patterns, uh, you know, people studying um, even, uh, you know, history of the colonization itself right mm -hmm. so you know so there's a lot of um kind of uh, academic access but i i do think that the missing part is and, and you mentioned it earlier um despite you know models of you know like the contact zone and you know the revisitation of that concept and even um even like during at the height of the implementation of nagpra that you know returned uh, objects and things like that, that um, also the creation of the uh, um, Native American uh, Museum in Washington, DC with the Smithsonian, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a whole lot of like uh, kind of awakening around native collections in, in the US. And, you know, uh, the, the Natural History Museum here, for instance, um, uh, had to retire its, um, 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 dioramas because of its depiction of Native Americans mm -hmm. uh, that associated them with, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. backward and primitive cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, and because also by sheer, the sheer fact that it's located in a natural history collection, which mm -hmm. associated them with dinosaurs and, <laughs> and, and all these things. So, uh, so there's a whole lot of, you know, context that's like that. And your question is quite good asking, so why not? connect you know uh there's there's been multiple dialogues with um native american tribes in michigan over its natural history collections uh even the at the Bonan botanical gardens there's like the 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 heirloom seeds that they have uh, that came from native communities already you know there's that um, um exchange of ideas happening between the inst institution and their collection but not the Philippines, even though we're here. Uh, so uh, I, I think partly the answer is like, as, as you said, it, it could be the lack of curatorial interest, especially, um, you know, in the past. Now, I would say this project we're doing is possible because mm -hmm. uh, there is actually curatorial interests now, mm -hmm. but there's historically none. Uh, I think it's more like the idea was, you know, um, first, um, the siloing of these collections. Um, it's still uh, prevalent now. If you go to, so I'm dividing the collections into cultural and scientific, you know, so the cultural ones are the ones that are in the archives and, you know, Philippine history um, and, and the photographs and things like that. And then and the scientific, uh, this is kind of crude uh, uh, way of, dividing them. The, the scientific ones are the, you know, the collections in natural history and the herbarium, where um, 
the approach to representation is scientific. Um, and so it's, it actually makes uh, the collection harder to access for communities because uh, first you need to have some kind of scholarly and legitimate uh, mm. reason for doing so. Also, these collections have always been regarded as academic research collections. Mm. So for instance, most uh, majority of the materials are considered research collections. They're not for exhibit. Um, mm -hmm. They're stored. Um, so the university started building a museum. Actually, it started with the Gute collection and then it expanded from there, you know, the expedition in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And then also because of that created its uh, anthrop anthropology department. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they've always seen these um, um, collections as something that they collected in the field and mm -hmm. then put them in storage they do research, their students did re the students did research, other scholars did research, but they're not actually meant for exhibition. And that kind of kept the collection in these literally cabinets, yeah. <laughs> in literal cabinets and hidden. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's uh, always been, they've always positioned the collections as for historical and research kind of use. And I think it's that kind of framework uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, and we also assume that if we invite Filipino scholars to access these collections, that we are actually, that's enough and sufficient access. Mm -hmm. But we all know that within the Philippine culture, there's also a kind of even divide between the elites yeah. and the mm -hmm. academics. And it, mm -hmm. they, they don't necessarily travel back to the community and yeah. return the knowledge. So, you know, yeah, my roundabout way of explaining it's <laughs> complicated and it's there's a particular kind of dynamic. Yeah. And then going back to the relational connections with the community, how do you navigate um, the differences in approaches and mindsets between the Filipinos in diaspora and Filipinos back in the Philippines? Like if you're trying to get their opinions. Uh, and engage with them. You know, how do you navigate there? Because probably the IPs are, you know, their social economic status is very different, their view of cultural memory and heritage. So how do you, yeah, how do you consult and then kind of, yeah, because I, I think that's kind of very difficult to navigate. Yeah, well, Tina, you're asking excellent questions. <laughs> and then you're hitting the, uh, you know, the like the key points here. So um, I would say, um, first, I'd like to say that, you know, uh, the, the Philippine community, both the diaspora and back home, it's not a monolithic community. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you an example. Um, we did a community consultation last summer and asked uh, members of the Ann Arbor community, so people living in this area, uh, also uh, in Detroit, because we're close to Detroit, and asked, well, what should we do with this collection? Uh, mm -hmm. And the assumption is that the collection is harmful. And, you know, there are some who um, actually um, express that they don't perceive it to be harmful. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, that's just, you know, uh, how things were in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, that it's, um, you know, how people collected scientifically or uh, how people did their work. So, uh, so, you know, as far as they're concerned, there's really no harm done, uh, mm -hmm. but some disagreed, right? You know, and um, so, so we don't really have the same response. Uh, in, in years ago, um, I conducted, you know, like a series of, uh, focus group discussions around Philippine items in American museums, mm. and and some um, depend. Uh, there's also an intergenerational uh, mm. perspective mm. happening, and there's mm. also um, you know like um, the you know their immigration status, right? So yes, meaning yes, uh, you yeah. know uh, you know third generation Philippine Americans might have some kind of affinity, but you know. Mm -hmm. Those baskets and textiles do not really represent me as an American, right, you know, right. kind of idea, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then for some Filipinos, they say, I don't want to see that because it's a reminder of what 
they say about us as savages, yeah, yeah. you know, and backwards. So very complex and complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so navigating those conversations is not easy. Also, yeah. like, for, for instance, uh, you know, uh, the people in charge of this project, me, myself and Deirdre de la Cruz and my other partners, you know, e even if we're Filipinos, you know, when we go back to the Philippines, we're, we're also considered settler uh, yeah. in the eyes of, <laughs> of indigenous <laughs> Filipinos because we're not yeah. a part yeah. of a tribe, right? So, yeah. Um, so yeah, like all that positionality and different perspectives, yeah. it's not good. easy, but I'm not giving up on the power of dialogue because it's actually mm -hmm. helping institutions figure out, you know, a path yeah. forward. Yeah. And uh, that that it's to invest more on 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 that work, and yeah. th because to me, uh, the collection being separated from the communities uh, is is you know worse than us. I mm -hmm. think debating about what to do with the collections. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then yung ano yung like real terms of engagement with the community with regard to power and resource sharing. Mm -hmm. And some some people think until the museum actually hires somebody and gives them a permanent long term job <laughs> to work on the collection. I mean, in terms of Anolang, like how do you actually how do you envision sharing power with these you know, with these with these people that you dialogue with? Yeah, um, yeah, or even material resources. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes because it's hard to. You know, because most of the time voluntary, and then you know people come in, and so how do you how do you address this kind of the the power imbalance, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Especially like um, what's unique about the Philippine situation, at least for now. I I'm not claiming that this will always be the case. Mm -hmm. There's really no uh, active uh, advocacy to repatriate the items. Yeah. Right, you I know, we that know that, well. right? Yeah, right. There's no, um, in fact, um, the attitude is more like, you know, I don't want those baskets and weaving back. We have tons of them back home. <laughs> uh, and the other um, thing that I hear is that basically, well, you know, uh, with climate change and all that, you want to share <laughs> those, yeah. <laughs> those materials too, so that we can study our own, you know, scientifically study. So there's that. And then, uh, so um, yeah, the, how, well, it, it depends on how we locate power in this uh, particular situation. You know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's not like um, the situation for um, Native American human remains and sacred objects mm -hmm. where yeah. there's real advocacy, right? Mm -hmm. And then to, to get them back as part yeah. of this, you know, claim to sovereignty mm. uh, and respect. Uh, and then also, um, and, and that's emanating from the cultures, from the, you know, so I think what the first thing we should do is learn, given the, you know, the number of uh, communities in the Philippines, mm -hmm. we, we need to like actually do our due diligence and examine yeah. What are the terms for the communities, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we have models. We, we never mm -hmm. lack models in, in our field of how do we share, how do we digitize, how do we provide digital access, and even create um, you know, ways to interact with the collection. Yeah. But you know, going back to the community and seeing that, that, that's tricky. And we're still actually trying to figure out a way to, to do this. Uh, yeah. Um, I know some people uh, would easily give up and say this is an impossible task, Ricky. You yeah. know, and I feel like, well, you know, it may not be in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like to me that we're playing with a different mode of temporality, I guess. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I like your idea more. of the slow, slow. Yeah. <laughs> Chaka yung reparative description and corrective actions, no, on the language in the catalogs. Yeah. How do you do you have a mechanism for annotating the the database yeah your... so uh, so what's happening now is actually we're compiling there are other universities doing reparative description you know like leading the way are actually yale at the yale collection uh mm -hmm. harvard but you know not necessarily for philippine collections but just you mm -hmm. know for other um marginalized or his, uh, mm -hmm. historically marginalized communities so there you know we're actually interested in the workflow because um because you know when at the end of the day, this is still relying on institutional work, 
So when yes. you go to when you talk to librarians, archivists, curators, and collections managers, you can't just say decolonize the collection. Mm -hmm. you, you need to show them like a kind of workflow. And yeah. normally yeah. it has to align with, depending on the field, like for librarianship, it has to align with the standards and guidelines mm -hmm. for description of description, yeah. right? Yeah. If you don't, you know, show that you know like a way to circumvent those rules or exemptions mm -hmm. it's very hard to you know in fact one pushback we heard is from uh you know a filipino librarian who said you know i spent decades mm -hmm. to describe the philippine material so they mm -hmm. could be discoverable and now you're telling me that i have to undo mm -hmm. my description because i use the library of congress subject heading and you know so you can't annotate ricky so like, what so right now, yeah, that's what we're um, mm. we're looking at all the possibilities, either add or maybe create like, um, you know, a, an extra layer, a meta mm. layer into the description mm. across the universities that says, because right now, you know, one problem is they're not integrated. Let's say the Gute yeah. uh, archaeological collections are at the uh, Anthro Museum. And the Guthe papers are at the Bentley Library. Mm -hmm. You know, they need to be brought together and make, you know, people realize that the archives and the museums are actually, very, while they're separate, they are very much connected. Very much connected. So mm -hmm. so so in, in terms of digital infrastructures and reparative description and all these actions, you know, we're we're looking at right now practical ways actually yeah. to implement and uh and it may end up um, having a digital infrastructure. I know I've been really quite mm -hmm. negative about, you know, jumping into the digital bandwagon immediately. But mm -hmm. who knows, you know, uh, to me is basically I want to listen and hear first uh, and dialogue and talk to scholars like you and maybe in the audience to hear of wh what's mm -hmm. happening. Because, I think for me. Uh, yeah, I think right. with, with the mapping, no, because of course we're learning all the time, no, as we keep adding to the inventory. But I guess it is kind of a, a superstructure in a way that we we have more editorial control because we 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 link back to the items in the repository, but then we are able to have more mechanisms for enunciation from the community. I say we have control, editorial control. We annotate the entries. So we don't have to go through the mechanism of the library and the kind of their editorial policies and things. So I don't know if if that if that in a way makes it makes a kind of kind of uh, aggregated inventory a mm -hmm. bit more manageable in terms of annotation, you know, mm -hmm. or mechanisms for enunciation from the community. Yeah. Um, I don't so, know. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, you know, we're faced with the realities and you know this, right? Like, for instance, some communities do not even have 24 hours of electricity, mm. you know, so how can they annotate yeah. things, you know? Uh, it's, it's difficult. So No, but, but like with the sure. mapping, we, we have workshops, for example, mm -hmm. and then we gather, you know, and then... I, I'm, I'm just talking more about the kind of the result of the workshops. It's easier to annotate a, a kind of freestanding mm. aggregation rather yeah. than the bad, to go into the library system. And, yeah, and yeah, individually, a, yeah. yeah. Because they have rules. And, they uh, have, systems, yes, yeah, yeah. And, so it's and, harder to... And systems don't necessarily talk to each other. Like, right. you know, the museum will have its different database, uh, mm -hmm. whatever they use. And then the live the archive will have the finding aid and it could be mm -hmm. not in a database but a pub you know published finding aid or yeah. digitized finding aid which is right right paper, yeah. you know so you know like the mm -hmm. infrastructure you you i i think yeah some will take the path of creating a kind of supra what's the term yeah. infrastructure <laughs> like that would become an umbrella for a cross I, yeah yeah but i guess know, that's kind of what we're doing with the mapping no to, mm -hmm. and, but you know to me it's too hard eh, to, mm -hmm. to and how do you, mm -hmm. that's right but how do you incorporate indigenous knowledge in that you know oh uh, so we do a lot of of in conversation uh, um, uh, um, so we do a lot of workshops so like we do mm -hmm. the just recently we did the Tagbanwa workshop. 
Mm -hmm. I think Sonia is here I, from the Cologne yeah. Museum. So yeah. it was actually really interesting, no? Because um, these were people uh, from all over, of course, Zoom <laughs> over Zoom. And then we did, we we transcribed and translated and everyone could just mm -hmm. pitch in. And then, then we had a product at the end and, and a paper. And then we were able to annotate right away, you know, and to show, of course, it doesn't speak back immediately to the museum the where the object is stored but at least we have this kind of um yeah addition to the baseline mm -hmm. the baseline data yeah that i mean i i really believe in the you know mm -hmm. in dialogues i mean yes yeah like uh, we over the years you know you you've, you've heard people being uh, critical of dialogues and they, they we're <laughs> tired of talking but I say, you know, it depends well, on think... who's listening and, you know, and where, you know, whose perspectives you're privileging. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because even like the, you know, and a lot of museums naman are very open to that, you know, like a lot come to, to us to say, how do we correct this sort of pan-regional terms? Yeah. This kind of the idea of the Moro. And then provenance research also they keep um you know I, and i think it, it is a good foundation no, for i don't know for eventual repatriation if there is a need yeah but more as you were saying which i agree very much with is there is a, a kind of focus on the colonial on the collector no, rather than yeah. and and there is definitely a need no, to put mm -hmm. in more details on i guess reversing on, on, the map also no yeah Where, and yeah like, like um one time in a one, one event i was accused of uh, basically you know um you're erasing history by uh changing the descriptive terms i said no it's we're not that's not the mm -hmm. recommendation the suggestion is to you know well for provincial research, of course, you want to know these people, and yeah. you know, so history, history of the item. You, you're not erasing that. You're just mm -hmm. basically adding more terms that mm -hmm. would help communities find themselves in your collection. Exactly. Because yeah. you know, as the, a good example is Wooster. Unless you know who Wooster is and what he did in the Philippines, which tribal communities he's been, mm -hmm. you you wouldn't know that he has items about your community right and you know magnify that into hundreds and thousands of collections it's yeah and then for scientific collections you know when you front scientific you know naming and convention and it's it's less findable in the philippines because we have local terms and names for certain things i mean mm -hmm. it's not this is not a surprise for um museum workers but yeah. i think the crux is basically on the implementation mm -hmm. and also like the i think the um, dismissing uh philippine collections as like oh it's far it's difficult we don't have the money mm -hmm. we don't have the infrastructure and things like that mm -hmm. so uh right now like the, the goal of our project is to show model mm -hmm. of, of for doing this and say you know th there's there's a path here and yeah. it's a slow one but mm -hmm. let's do the first step. Yeah. I think we have questions. Yes. From the audience. Hi, okay, great. Thanks so much, uh, Ricky and Christina for the, the, the wonderful discussion. I didn't really want to interrupt because you, you, you guys were kind of going uh, the really- uh, <laughs> And, you know, and I know, and we miss each other and this is our only opportunity to chat. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm sure everyone learned a lot from your, from your discussion. And I mean, I really appreciated that sort of focus on practice and implementation. And, and you know, I, I like how you said, like, you can't just show up at a museum or a library and say, like, decolonize everything. You actually have to give people, like, a workflow, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we have a couple of uh, questions from the audience. And uh, I would like to, uh, you know, encourage everyone else to, to please type your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we still have about uh, 20 uh, minutes for for questions. Uh, I just want to to pose the the first question that's asked by um, Almira uh, Gill. So uh, Gillis, it's Gillis. Gillis. Uh, yeah. Almira, Almira mm -hmm. Gillis. Uh, who's Hi, a, Almi. Uh, we know Almi. I know Almi. Oh, okay. <laughs> Chicago. So so she's a research associate from the Field Museum, Chicago Field Museum, and she says one of the encumbrances to the display of the Field Museum Philippine 
ethnographic collection, they have uh, 10,000 objects, but only 20 are on display. Uh, is actually financial. So whose responsibility is it? Institutional stewards or the community? Whose responsibility is it to find funding? And is it a local uh, diasporic community or, or global, including Filipinos in the Philippines? So I think this kind of connects to what you've been talking about uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the financial aspect of this, you know. So I I'll tell you what happened here at Michigan. Um, you know, over the years, uh, the academic community here has really been conscious about, you know, the existence of Philippine collections and the lack of infrastructures to mm -hmm. connect them to communities. And, you know, and also the dark colonial history, right? Um, when I was a PhD student here and then I left and, uh, and then came back uh, as a professor and then I, you know, with, with tenure and I think it was, at that time, there's already uh, other efforts to, you know, build the collection, do exhibits. Uh, there's even protests uh, from many years back on the natural history collections here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like for us, the, you know, the timing is just ripe to go to the university and say, we want to do this, but we need funding. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the university has an arm called the Humanities Collaboratory, and the Humanities Collaboratory is, you know, under the office of the provost, and they have a pot of money, and we applied for, uh, you know, support. Uh, so in this instance, it's actually the university that provided uh, the funding. Uh, of course, it also relied on um, the willingness of the scholars here, the Filipino scholars, to work. Uh, because uh, we, ask, we, we also think that it has to be led by people from the community uh, and the scholars from the Philippines who are here because we are here. So mm -hmm. there's also that, uh, you know, effort. Um, maybe at some point, going back to Almi's question about, so whose responsibility? Um, th that's a complex uh, and hard question to answer in the sense that, you know, the reality of Michigan is, you know, different. You know, it's a university institution. There's uh, the, the, the whole uh, anti-racist rhetoric is really, uh, you know, as a university really open here. Uh, once a scholar like me and Deirdre go to the university and say, you know, we need to dismantle, you know, the racist uh, practices that we have here, there's a tendency to work with us, you know, and, you know, with, you know, willingness to do that, which I do not know. And I'm not certain if it's, you know, the same for institutions. I'm not saying that the Field Museum is one of those that this is just that difficult because I know some of the curators and people like Almi, they are doing great mm -hmm. work and they actually have inspired me with, you know, the, the co-curation uh, mm -hmm. concept. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, right now we're saying, well, it, um, other than co-curation, there should be counter-curation as well from the community, you know, like the, the kind of resistance. It's not always harmonious, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you have to counter. And all of those models, I think for a university like this, they're actually also excited around, you know, the possibilities of this, of rethinking, uh, you know, new frameworks and new ideas, you know. So for us, the funding comes from the university and, you know, through the efforts of the, the scholars in this um, university. I know in Chicago, there's a big Filipino population. There's a consulate there, uh, so mm -hmm. potentially. But I don't know if uh, Filipinos at this stage are willing to, you know, provide funding and money. Um, I have a... I know of another effort, another, a different, I'm not going to name the group, but another, uh, you know, uh, Asian population, and they are having a hard time soliciting donation to support the project, because there's just not a culture of giving to institutions in the same way that many um, cultures have a kind of philanthropic spirit that I will give you an endowment of this much, uh, you know, um, 
I don't know. I'm, I'm maybe overgeneralizing, but it's really hard for me to find Filipinos to open their pocketbooks and donate. So like right now, we're going the route of the institutions supporting this. But you know, Almi, you're in Chicago. There's probably a lot of <laughs> entrepreneurs there. Almi, so, I have to say, though, that um, uh, Jamie Kelly gave us uh, permission to use the entire database of the 10K a collection, including the high-res photos and catalogs to add to the, the inventory, the mapping. So I know there are limitations to digital, to kind of a digital kind of museum in some sense, but I guess for me, it's always better to just have that type of access and then work on that access uh, by, by connecting it, uh, these two. Even digital repatriation, I, I think, um, Ikin is here and she's so very, very um, successful with, with uh, bringing these high resolution photos of textiles and bringing it to the weaving community in the Cordilleras and they're able and using a digital loom, they've been able to revitalize the textile industry because that's what the, 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 the specific community wanted. No? They wanted to see these old designs, um, 150 year old designs preserved in museums. So, so in some sense, because of this, you know, it's kind of, I guess it's not a slow way to deal with it, Vicky, but because, you know, you, in a way you dump the, the, the colonial you know, into as, as a baseline you know, in, this, in this huge inventory. But at yet, I think there are ways also to manage it so that it becomes mm -hmm. more you know that you it can intervene in in some ways you can make sure that you actually put mechanisms for intervention mm -hmm. no? hey, like you know workshop. listen for me it's just like uh i think we benefit from the diversity of approaches mm -hmm. you know we yeah. we have different approaches but at the end of the day i'm not i don't see myself in competition with any projects mm -hmm. uh, happening in fact i do think that it's a particular ecology that sometimes maybe things should happen simultaneously, mm -hmm. the fast and the slow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and like, um, cause I, I do think that, you know, I mean, like uh, Ikin is doing um, amazing work, you know, mm -hmm. bringing collections. I, I know like she's, she's for the Wooster photographs here, she's done photo elicitation right. in places that physically I cannot Mm -hmm. go you know and you know all those ties and connections mm -hmm. uh so you know and even the national museum of the philippines once uh, used uh, some images of wooster from the american museum of natural history in new york you know getting high resolution copies from there for their exhibits so there's there are those kinds of exchanges mm -hmm. that i think are good uh like facilitated digitally mm -hmm. right because it's uh, it's um, one one notion of repatriation that I'm very fascinated um, with is not that of a like actual return, but you mm -hmm. know knowledge repatriation. You actually repatriate knowledge because sometimes it's not really the object that mm -hmm. people are seeking; it's yeah. the knowledge embedded in those objects. And sometimes digitization could facilitate many of those. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, so we do have examples of, you know, actual repatriation of objects in, in the Philippines, right? And, uh, but a lot of those are very like symbolic, mm -hmm. you know, like the Balangiga bells, it's like yeah. stolen by the American soldiers. Returning has some kind of meaning, you know, nationally. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of the time, the majority of the collections in museums and archives and libraries here are more like, I would say, falling under the rubric of, you know, knowledge repatriation, mm -hmm. give them the knowledge, give them exactly. knowledge yeah. about, you know, how traditions and rituals are performed, knowledge mm -hmm. about land, knowledge about, you know, uh, natural resources and things like that, so that people mm -hmm. are informed, so that they know, you know, um, the, both the cultural and scientific uh, knowledge that they actually have that are embedded in these collections. So I think, you know, there's a whole lot of exciting work to be done around knowledge repatriation. Yeah. And it, it's, and uh, well, I guess um, with digital repatriation, uh, the, the, the idea, the cost factor is very minimal 
in mm-hmm. some sense, no? So yeah. And that's yeah. another, that's another, I uh, know. And then of course the preservation of the material, of course mm-hmm. there's no aura of the mm-hmm. actual thing, but if it was indeed knowledge repatriation, um, there are ways, even now technologically, there's a lot now of, um, yeah, computational tools that you can mm-hmm. use no? with digital repatriation. Mm-hmm. You can use an AI and look at uh, emerging patterns from, uh, kind of diasporic objects. And then once they're aggregated, you can see uh, stylistic patterns. You can see mm-hmm. kind of diffusion of, of uh, I don't know, not really diffusion, but even connections with Southeast Asia when, when you begin to aggregate the whole thing no, in, in one. So yeah, in terms of knowledge repatriation, I do think- um, mm-hmm. there, Sometimes, there's... you know, um, I- um like the term knowledge repatriation rather than uh, digital repatriation because when you say digital repatriation you're focusing on the medium Mm -hmm. you know but the the solution is not really the the medium it's through the you know access to knowledge Mm -hmm. and also i'm i've kind of i've been reading a whole lot about digital repatriation and i do embrace some of the critique that say Mm -hmm. it's not repatriation where you're only giving back copies yeah (laughs) so but i say but there's a lot of power in those copies because they have knowledge embedded in them so Mm -hmm. why don't we just be more accurate and say this is knowledge repatriation that's a very good point actually Mm -hmm. no so so yeah it kind of seems with this question of repatriation is really dependent on what the community wants and and needs Mm -hmm. um, from from the objects Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah thanks so much for kind of complicating that that, uh, question a little more Mm -hmm. uh i just want to take another question uh uh, we have uh, well, 10 minutes left uh, for today's session. Uh, a question from uh, Sujata Migama, um, who's a professor at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And she thanks um, you know, Dr. Ricardo for uh, the interesting introduction uh, and also for your critique of the term uh, decolonization and introducing us to the story of the Michigan man and histories of collecting at the, mu- at the university. Uh, and she appreciates your emphasis on building community relations and wonders, uh, are there any um, models for you and your team beyond the Native American uh, experiences, which of course, I guess is the most uh, natural to turn to given your, your location in, in the US. Mm-hmm. Are there any other models for, for you that you follow? And also are there you know, similarly large, other similarly large Filipino collections outside the Philippines and how do they, uh, do you know of how they uh, engage with the goals to decolonize? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I would say stay tuned because, you know, like our project is a two year project. We only started in September. We, we did a series of conversations in the summer. Summer here is basically uh, uh, May, June, July, August. Uh, and then after that, we got two year funding beginning September to actually create the model. So what we're doing is basically let's try some um, activities and programs and see how um, it will work for us and create like a kind of toolkit that others could see because we know and conscious of the fact that we are not the only university with large Philippine collections. Harvard has a Philippine collection. Uh, I know Berkeley. Uh, I don't know if you're watching the news, Berkeley. Uh, there's a lot of currently happening uh, protest in Berkeley about you know the treatment of Philippine collections there. Um, I know Cornell has Philippine materials, uh, Yale and Princeton, basically like big universities, right? The and Penn Museum. The Penn Museum also, yeah, because I've done Huge. research there. And then of course, you know, field museum, you know, non-university based. Um, the, um, the American Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian, its largest Asian collection is actually yeah. Philippines. Why? Yeah. Because we were a colony, right? So we really need models. And this is what I'm saying, you know, we need to create those models uh, while saying this may not apply for just about every institution, but let, we'll show you how we're doing it. And then so one of the things that we're, uh, we have different kind of points. One is reparative description. Like how do we fix the catalog, right? That's one. Uh, Another is how do we engage um, 
communities. You know, we've been doing all this series of dialogues. We had a dialogue uh, by going to like the Philippine Center in Detroit, for instance. We want to do more of that. But one is to open the collection and do what we call the uh, the Reconnect Lab, which is patterned after, you know, if you Google Museums Lab, you'll see many models of Museums Lab, but we call it Reconnect Lab, where you, you bring objects and then around the object, you create like dialogues for people to, you know, uh, talk. Uh, and so the problem right now is our location, you know, uh, it's almost impossible, plus COVID, to bring Filipinos. We have a we're planning to bring uh, indigenous Filipinos uh, here, but you know, as, as you know, number one, visa restrictions, number two, COVID and availability, you know? So, uh, but if we choose to, we have funding for that, uh, but we're saying, oh, we have to wait. Yeah, I know. So that's why, you know, we cannot make decisions and say, this is how you do it. We want to test them. We also have an artist series where we want to bring diverse artists to interact with the collection. Uh, we opened up uh, you know, the, the catalogs to artists and say, what can you make of it? You know, what, 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 what will you make? But there's no pressure to make something, but for them to interact with the collection and see if they do something. You know? So there, we have an artist series. Uh, um, and then of course, there's a pedagogy around this that the university is really interested, like involving the students. Like, how do you really do reparative and decolonial work? Uh, it, it cannot just, it's not sustainable if it's the same people over and over, right? You know, so uh, we uh, are we're working with students across universities at different levels, undergrad to up, all the way up to the PhD. Uh, and, you know, it does make me so busy. <laughs> with all of these things but you know it's it's the kind of uh hard work that i really like so to to answer the question we are building the model we, with the caveat that you know this this works for us here in michigan maybe you can uh emulate some of it or be inspired by some of it and maybe it will work um and and yeah but the thing is, you know, I wouldn't discount too much the progress in Native American collections because, you know, a lot of the issues are resonating with us. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the arguments could very well be applied to Philippine collection. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the thing is, we need to sit down and like see how they apply really to us. Um, I'm extremely grateful because in, in a sense, you know, they made institutions more open mm -hmm. to these kinds of work you know so um the the term i use is i build i build from the native american uh, models that are out there mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, christina do you have anything to add um on in, in your work with uh, mapping uh material culture philippine material culture and how you know what kinds of models have you been uh following in your work in in my work um, so, well, the, um, there's, um, I don't know, uh, people might accuse me of being too theoretical, but hey, you know, I'm an academic. Um, so I could, I could put it in the chat later on, but there's a work by Sharon McDonald. It's a co-authored piece called Otherwising. Um, and um, maybe somebody could quickly Google that. If you put Sharon McDonald Otherwising, you'll see the PDF of that work. Uh, and, you know, Sharon McDonald is for, you know, like the museum studies scholars here probably is quite familiar, you know, she's done a lot of work uh, thinking around museums, but she was particularly looking at anthropological collections and how, to, how do we think otherwise, you know, other ways of doing things. And, uh, and, and that actually was enough to inspire me. So yeah, how do we perform otherwise in this collection? How do we do things otherwise when we know it's not working? Uh, there's, you know, like it's very uh, liberating to see to see that you know argument. You know, like the the one I cited earlier, "Slow Archives" by Kim Kristen and uh, Jane Anderson. Also, you know, uh, advocating for the slow process, not jump immediately into you know big projects that you think will be high yield, but create and form relationships. Uh, that's another one. Uh, you know. I've been um, 
you know, like that. My experience when I was still a student and I was invited at the Field Museum and then they did the co-curation uh, event in there. That one was amazing, you know, bringing community members together. I was there. I was, it was very touching. Almira brought me actually and uh, John uh, Terrell, the curator. Um, so there's, there are things that are in practice that informed me over the years. Uh, my own scholarship in virtual reunification and digital repatriation. I'm, I'm actually not against digitization. I'm uh, more nuanced about it, having studied, you know, the, what, that, what the process could actually achieve and also the limitations, particularly the limitations for communities. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, like the models I'm talking about, they, they will not give you like um, one size fits all, like map or guidelines that let's say, if you do step one, two, and three, then you're, you're set. I, I think the slow archives movement and the other wising movement, these are people who tend to think with communities, think through the processes, uh, do the dialogue, and um, then start working slowly. But, you uh, know, I can go back to that specificity that you were uh, talking about mentioning earlier as well. Yeah, I mean, if you examine the history of these institutions, it, it took them decades, if not centuries, to build the collection. We cannot undo those <laughs> structures uh, in 10 years, I think. I, I'm unprepared to uh, take this project beyond, you know, like beyond my lifetime. And that's why I believe in mentoring students and young students, because I do think that it will continue until until we're all gone. And because it, it took the same amount of time mm. to create That's true. Of these collections. It, it will probably take generations to kind of, you know, uh, do this work. Uh, yeah. just, uh, Christina, could we, we only have a couple of minutes uh, mm -hmm. remaining. Uh, Christina, do you have anything to add to, to this? Any final sort of thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I, I do really agree with um, Ricky. No? no, there's no point in in access, if 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 you define access as just mere data, no, on on you know, in in not really connecting to the, but um, connecting to the cultural or, or originators and the communities um, who who actually own the the cultural property, I guess. But I guess there's also something to be said about um, aggregate um, go putting the data out there, uh, baseline data, so that you already get access and then work from there in terms mm -hmm. of, of connecting to the community. So, so you have something in, in some sense uh, already. So, it, so yeah, again, that's a different model in some sense, but I, I, I think the uh, ultimate goal is really allow to empower you know, the cultural or, or originators to have a say to enunciate to to own this 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 cultural this cultural heritage i guess that they have mm -hmm. great thanks so much uh, well so with that i think i need to kind of uh, bring the session to a close um really want to thank you know dr Benzalan and uh, dr martinez Juan for your really rich and productive discussion today uh, i mean i you know I, i've also learned a lot and i think um gives me a lot, of, a lot to think about for my own sort of kind of curatorial work at, at the ACM in, in Singapore. Um, and uh, also want to thank our audience uh, for, your, for your time and, and uh, attention and for you know, all your questions. Um, so, you know, once again, remember to sign up for the final webinar and our Decolonizing Curating the Museum and Southeast Asia series next week uh, at the same time. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, to, to those who celebrate today is actually Deepavali, so you know, happy Deepavali or, or happy Diwali uh, to everyone all over the world. And um, yeah, with that, um, I'll bring today's session to a close. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.